welcome everybody back to the big blue in the bronx youtube channel don't forget to hit that like button comment and subscribe turn on that post notification bell so you know when a live stream pops or your drops also share this out as well getting this uh to other nfl fans giant fans other people on social media during the dead time in the nfl offseason would be a big help uh to this channel in terms of reaching milestones and stuff like that today I have Nick Falato alongside me to, dis to discuss undrafted free agents. He does a lot of work, a lot of great work in the Giants community. Uh, Nick, I'll start off first thoughts on the Giants after the draft, after free agency. Uh, and just general first thoughts, man. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Alex. Thank you so much for having me here on the podcast. And in terms of the draft, I was ecstatic after day one. I mean, who would have thought? Last year at this time, the New York Giants would be able to land Kayvon Thibodeau and Evan Neal. Both of those guys were in the conversation to be the number one overall selection. The Giants ended up getting about five and seven. So that is a complete home run. And I appreciated the rest of the draft. I felt like Joe Shane was building this roster around individuals and players that he saw with his own two eyes because he didn't necessarily have a scouting department that was in place that was fully his and also players that fit the mold of athletic young with a lot of upside guys like Cordell Flott guys like Joshua Azudu, Wandale Robinson I feel like he is a particular case I'm excited to see how Brian Dable can utilize his skill set along with Kadarius Tony. but I was excited after the draft I think it was a little bit off the beaten path in this day two day three a little bit but I think a lot of those guys can control tribute within the coaching philosophy of Brian Dable and Wink Martindale on the defensive side of the football. So I'm looking forward to seeing how that kind of materializes. And then in terms of the UDFAs, we'll get into some of these guys. I low key think some of these guys can legit crack the 53 man roster. And it's partly because the New York Giants are turning over regimes. And usually when that happens, a lot of the guys who weren't all that competitive in the prior regime, but they were prior regime guys, they get booted to the wayside. And these UDFAs who have another three years on their contract after this season, they get an opportunity to step up and, you know, hoist that mantle. And I look at guys like Austin Allen at the tight end position. It's one of the weaker positions on the roster. I think like he could possibly be one of those guys, but even more so, I think Yusef Corker, Trenton Thompson, the two safeties have a legit shot to make the roster. And then Jeremiah Hall, he's a really interesting one. We'll get into all these guys, so I won't just sit here and start naming them all right now. But I think Jeremiah Hall, if the Giants want that H-back hybrid tight end, I mean, where does he exactly fit? But he does a lot of things well. He's another player out of Oklahoma who had a pretty good role in Lincoln Riley's offense. Yeah, he's actually our first guy that we're going to talk about. Well, what I'm going to say is this about this whole offseason, really about the draft is they got younger players and they got older players because you look at some of these guys on drafted free agents and guys coming out of college. Darren Evans, for example, he only played two years, really. 2020, 2021, uh, more in 2021 after the injury to Derek Stingley, and then it was him and Flott and the other guys at LSU. And then you have a guy like Trenton Thompson who spent, what, five, six years in college. So uh, there's younger, there's older, there's a little more inexperienced and then experienced guys like Trenton Thompson – but also, I think what us Giant fans could make as the theme from this draft class and really this offseason is versatility, right? Uh, yeah. Jeremiah Hall is one. Uh, Cordell Flott, he could play the outside. He could play the slot. There's a lot of versatile players that they've brought in here. And we could also attribute that to the offensive line. Joshua Zudu can play tackle. He can play guard. Uh, Marcus McKeithen, I believe, can play center and guard. So there's going to be a lot of guys that are going to come in with the theme of versatile, but it's going to be the survival of the fittest come training camp. Should be the survival of the fittest come training camp. And Timon Fox is another one that was like six years, pulled that whole Van Wilder thing in college, just playing a ton of snaps and a lot of experience. And it seemed like that's what Joe Shane and Brian Dable and this entire front office predicated in undrafted free agency because they had so many reps to watch. They had so much experience, these players in college, that they are a little bit older, but they have played a lot more. So then you could see how skilled they are, bring them into your building, see if they can actually crack the roster. If not, try to squeak them on the practice squad, which could be a little precarious. I mean, you can ask the Steelers how that worked with Quincy Roche last year. The Giants are the beneficiary of that. So, yeah, it seemed like – they wanted to draft a lot of young players, which they did outside of DBJ Davidson, who is like, you know, 24 and a half years old, pretty old for a, a prospect. And then everybody else is just a little bit of uh, those UDFAs are just a little bit older. Some of them, like you said, Trenton Thompson and Tom on Fox being two that really come to my mind. So as I mentioned, the first guy we're going to go over is Jeremiah Hall. 
Uh, he is he plays the role of H back and did in Lincoln Riley's Oklahoma offense. And I'm going to be honest with you, Nick, and I shouldn't really have done this, but he is my ultimate favorite undrafted free agent for this roster. Uh, you know, he he's not he's not the biggest dude out there, but you know, him getting wide open in some of these plays that I've watched from Oklahoma and some of their games. And one of my favorite things about him is his yards after the catch ability. You know, he runs through tackles. He's very flexible. And, you know, some things he could get better at. And that's why some of these guys are undrafted free agents. He doesn't really possess much straight line speed and needs to be a tad more patient as a runner. But I like him overall. I, I don't think he's going to be used uh, like he was at Oklahoma. But I think he could have a really – uh, I really don't have a word to describe it, but I think he could be using this offense really well with the creativity of Dable and Kafka. Uh, your initial thoughts on Jeremiah Hall. What is he good at, in your opinion? What is he not? I think Jeremiah Hall is like a Swiss Army knife of that running back quasi tight end position. When I watched his film, I actually thought he reminded me a lot of Elijah Penny, which you think of much more as a halfback, a fullback, whereas Jeremiah Hall, a little bit more of an H back tight end. But Jeremiah Hall, I think he had like six carries or, or something like that this season. He did well in those short yardage situations when he was tasked to block the edge whether that be from the backfield or from the H back, he wasn't really in line all that often, but from those positions, he took good angles to the block point. And then I felt like he had a good, strong punch. He swiveled his hips. He brought this flexibility before I felt like he did a pretty solid job, you know, creating a seal, whether that be outside or inside for his running back down there in Oklahoma. And in terms of him as a receiver, man, he's not the most explosive, you know, he's not going to jump up at high point and win these contested catches all the time, but he has soft hands, and he has a little bit of nuance to his route running. You'll see a little shimmy shake. You'll see a little head nod. You'll see the little shoulders move. And I feel like he does a good job kind of creating separation against linebackers, or at least he did in college, in that short to intermediate parts of the field, just because he knows how to create separation with his body and with deceptiveness and all of those aspects of his game. So I like Jeremiah Hall. My question with Jeremiah Hall, though, is what kind of offense are we going to see with Mike Kafka and Brian Dable? Now, we, we're not really 100% certain with that. I think what helps him out is the Giants don't have a fullback. Last year, they had, they had several fullbacks, right? They had Colin Gillespie. They had Elijah Penny. This year, they don't really have one. So if they want to incorporate, you know, the fullback packages, you know, multiple running back packages and short yardage, Jeremiah Hall fits that, and he can play H-back. And when you look at the Giants' tight end room, you have Daniel Bellinger. I think he can play H-back, but he can also play Y. He might be the best option at Y at the end of the day. We'll have to wait and see. I'm not going to anoint him there yet, but there is a – world where that is the case and then you have ricky seals jones and jordan akins and chris myrick none of those guys are are going to be long-term fixtures here and none of them are guys who are all that i guess you could say just great overall as tight ends tight end position it's a pretty shallow position at the moment so i think like ricky seals jones former wide receiver i think he can come in and he can be a someone who can win contested catches create separation for you be a little bit of a mismatch type of guy but he's not necessarily a blocker and Jordan Akins kind of falls into the same mold, but he has experience with Andy Bischoff down there in Houston, but he's not really a blocker either. So will there ultimately be a spot for Jeremiah Hall where Brian Dable will be like, yeah, we can utilize this guy's skill set. I think one thing that's definitely going in his direction, because I'm not hundred percent sure on that yet is he is a special teams guy. And I know Joe judge, Dave Gettleman, special teams, they were so synonymous, but every coach looks for special teams, guys. You need special teams. You need that third phase. You have offense, defense, you have special teams. And if Jeremiah Hall, can prove to be a big enough asset on offense, whether that be at tight end, fullback, halfback in certain situations, wear all those hats, then his ability on special teams, I think, can carry him over the edge to make the final 53-man roster. But it's definitely up in the air. And, dude, training camp is going to be so exciting because a lot of these UDFAs we're talking about, none of them are obviously – they're all UDFAs. None of them are locked in, going to make the team. But they all have at least opportunity. So every day in training camp is going to be a fight of these guys just scratching and crawling. And I'm going to be looking and paying attention to the beat and seeing what the heck's going on. Cause it's pretty exciting. Jeremiah Hall is one of the more interesting ones. Yeah, I definitely agree with you there. Uh, you brought up obviously the tight end position. It's shallow in terms of blocking where you have Daniel Bellinger, who 
Um, locked a lot at San Diego State, was really underutilized in terms of uh, the receiving format. But other than that, you really don't have any established blockers like Austin Allen. He's an undrafted free agent for a reason. Ricky Seals, Jones, and Jordan Aikens, I mean, they are what they are at this point in their career. Their receiving tight ends are not necessarily the blocking type. And, you know, if, as, as a Giants fan, just experiencing it, both of us, we haven't had like a good blocking tight end and a receiving tight end for many years now. Um, obviously, you brought up the fact that we kept – two fullbacks last year. I mean, Penny was more of a running back in some situations it was honestly odd. Um, you know, when uh, Brightwell wasn't used and these other guys weren't used or whatever the case may be, I, th I thought it was odd. Um, but could we possibly be looking at Jeremiah Hall being used the way Reggie Gilliam and Pat DeMarco were used in the Bills offense? Uh, you know, Anthony Sherman uh, in the, in the chiefs offense for a few years. So it's going to be interesting to see. Uh, and if, Hall had, and he looks like the special teams type of guy with his body type uh, and his frame. He looks like he could be on special teams. And if he could bring that along with, you know, the offensive prowess and I wouldn't say explosiveness, but the abilities he has on offense, if he could bring all of that, that could possibly mean, okay, we can add a couple of playmakers. We could add a couple of defensive linemen that don't necessarily have special teams experience. But Jeremiah Hall and some of the other guys we brought on as you know versatile pieces, they have that, so we don't need to keep a guy because of special teams. And I think that's really going to help them uh, moving forward. I'm wondering if uh, the Giants will even keep a guy because of special teams. We saw Joe Judge do that with, you can argue, you can argue Cam Brown, but Cam Brown, he played enough defensive snaps that it's not there. But like Nate Ebner, Colin Gillespie, those guys were really just on the roster because of special teams. Gary Brightwell, a big reason why he was drafted was because of special teams, and they liked him a lot. I do think he can offer something on offense, so I don't want to pigeonhole him in that manner. But I think on this team, you're going to need to be able to wear many hats. And when I look at someone like Cam Brown, and I know we're not necessarily going over him, but he is so good on special teams, and he can play edge and linebacker that I feel like he has – the opportunity to make this team. But I don't think we're going to be seeing the Colin Gillespie's and the Nate Ebner's of the world, unless the Giants can find like a Matthew Slater type, somebody who is like an elite special teams player. And that's not something that I, I really see as of right now on the roster. But you're right with Hall, because you brought up the fullbacks that were used, Anthony Sherman and DeMarco and all the fullbacks. That would be his path onto this roster, because if you look at the roster, who else is wearing that fullback hat if the Giants want to rock a fullback? They want to go in eye formation. It doesn't seem like they're going to be that type of team to rock you know 21 personnel 22 personnel all that often but there are contexts and situations where they're going to want to do that on third and short on goal line and jeremiah hall fits that really well <laughs> or if they can get really uh wild which we've seen recently in, in the nfl in those situations you put big dexter lawrence as the fullback and just have him plow forward and just have saquon follow him yeah um shout out to justin pettick but i was hearing him talk whether it was uh, I think it was in a live chat. He was talking about how for a couple of years, Ben McAdoo didn't use a fullback. And that reminded, he didn't mention it specifically, but Robert Thomas was a defensive tackle. He was a rotational piece along with Jay Bromley and crew. And he was basically the fullback. Um, but obviously having Jeremiah Hall, you can just do more than have him as a lead blocker. Yeah. Um, you know, so that's that's what I really like about him. Nikita I mean, Whitlock too. Remember Nikita Whitlock Nikita a couple years Whitlock. back? About a half decade um, ago. Yep, he's one of the guys. Do you think Jeremiah Hall, and obviously it's going to be a big jump as an undrafted free agent, do you think he's going to be used more than any of the fullbacks that we've had in the last couple of years? See, I think it could get a little tricky there. Because I think if you use him as an H back or, you know, a tight end, because he has that skill set, he played it in college, then yes. But as a traditional fullback, no, because Jason Garrett's offense was more conducive to the usage of a fullback. Whereas we're not 100% certain what this offense is going to look like, but I would imagine they're going to want to try to get more 11 personnel out there, maybe a little bit more 10 personnel just to, to get the skill sets of Kenny Galladay, Kadarius, Tony Sterling, Shepard, if he's healthy, Wandell Robinson out there. But again, it's all going to come down to the situation. But I would say probably not in terms of fullback. I think this offense is going to be a little bit more spread, a little bit more open than the previous offense that we saw. So let's move on to the next guy, Jushan Corbin, running back out of Florida State. Uh, he was about 113 rushing yards away from 1,000, but he did eclipse 1,000 scrimmage yards at Florida State. And, you know, the pain for me, even though we won that game, is he, his biggest run was against my Notre Dame. Uh, so, unfortunately, I have to live with that. But 
In terms of strengths and weaknesses, he's got great vision, bounces around piles and defenders, creates yardage, follows blocks, displays great patience, uh, possesses a burst and works runs, improvises when a play blows up. But the one thing about him is he won't break too many tackles. And I, I don't know about you, Nick, but I've been looking for the last couple of years, ever since Saquon got hurt, just a young running back. Last year, they drafted Brightwell. And a lot of people are like, well, he's just a special teams guy. There's really nothing to him. And he wasn't used as a running back. Maybe in blowout situations, I remember week one, when the game was basically over, he caught a pass for four yards that ended up moving the chains. But it was, what, 27 to 6, 27 to 7 at at that point in the game. So it was basically dead time. Um, But with that being said, I've been looking for a young running back for years, knowing that Saquon – ultimately isn't the answer if you want to be truthful to yourself in my opinion where you know a few years ago we, we, it seems like the Giants drafted running backs a lot they drafted Paul Perkins in 2016 they drafted yes. Wayne Gallman in uh, 2017 but then it stopped uh, obviously they had Saquon but after that it just stopped with the young running back thing but now we have a chance with an undrafted free agent and someone who's explosive like Corbin uh, to put him on the roster. What do you think of him? And uh, just give your thoughts on Deshaun Corbin. I think Deshaun Corbin has a chance to make this team, and it's because the running back room behind Saquon Barkley is is pretty weak. I mean, Matt Breida, he's a, he's a nice option. I feel like I, I like the fact that they added somebody like him who can be an asset as a receiver out of the backfield, knows the offense, yada, yada. But behind Matt Breida, you have Antonio Williams, have Gary Brightwell and then you have this kid Deshaun Corbin along with Sandro Platzcomer who a lot of people probably don't expect to make the team now that he's not in the international portal anymore but what I liked about Corbin you mentioned how he doesn't break tackles and and you're right you're not going to see him lower his shoulder Brandon Jacobs style and, and steamroll somebody but what he does is he angles his body well enough to create difficult tackle attempts for defenders. And I feel like that's something that he does even in these small confined spaces. There are plenty of times throughout his film, whether it's against Clemson, whether it's against Notre Dame, where it seems like a linebacker or a safety hasn't teed up, but he's able to angle his body just well enough to kind of force a, if the defender doesn't use a great technique, kind of force him to kind of lunge into the tackle point and then make contact with his arm, but not really enough contact to slow Corbin down. And Corbin is, he's good enough. He's strong enough to run through those arm tackles. So I feel like the way he angles his body as a runner is advantageous to picking up extra yardage. But yeah, he's not going to like bowl over people. I don't also don't think he's, he's not really a burner. I know he had that long run against Notre Dame, but I don't like view him as, you know, a four three type of player like he's not necessarily that on the football field but he does have agility he does have a good change of direction he does have a really good feel for when he presses the line of scrimmage how to read his blocks utilize that vision that you were mentioning before alex and then explode through the hole he does a solid job i'd say playing that cat and mouse game with the linebackers and then reacting to what the linebacker doesn't react to i i think he has the realistic shot at this roster but it's still going to be up in the air he's still a udfa he still has a lot to prove but he can offer something as a receiver he will offer something as a running back i think he'll be a solid change of pace guy behind saquon barkley so that's kind of where i'm at which is sean gordon i think he's a, a solid option as a udfa but even if he makes this roster Saquon Barkley, if Saquon Barkley's injured, he's going to, you know, man most of the running back snaps. And then it's going to be Matt Breida. So he has to really crack it on special teams for Corbin, which he has an experience, which he has experience doing. So that's kind of where I'm at with Corbin at the moment. Yeah. And something to add as well, his first two years college were at Texas A&M. And then he moved to Florida State after those first two years, and he got more reps in the receiving game. You can take a look at the stat sheet, and it will easily tell you where it was 10 receptions and six receptions, moves to Florida State, uh, 19 receptions and 25 receptions. So he got more reps in the receiving game, which honestly I'm looking for in terms of the preseason and just generally in this offense. Uh, Whether you talk about Corbin, you talk about Breida, you talk about a guy like Saquon Barkley. You know, we've heard uh, a couple of times Brian Dable will use Saquon Barkley as a wide receiver. So we know that Saquon Barkley is not going to be playing in preseason games, but Matt Breida probably will. Uh, Shashawn Corbin, if he's got to make the roster somehow. So um, with that being said, do you think he's got a shot over a guy like Antonio Williams? And for me, I think Breida is going to make the roster. Uh, I looked at some of his pass blocking stats because for a couple of years now, we haven't had a running back who's good on third down, but apparently he's good in that area. 
He's good as a receiving back. I know, obviously, he spent some time with Buffalo last year, and I'm not even looking at his prime in San Francisco. And the thing I look at with Breida is he doesn't play 50 50- percent of the staffs for any team he's played for but he's so productive that you don't even realize it but the thing with Brita obviously I look at is the receiving game the pass blocking stuff but Antonio Williams who's what played one NFL game compared to Deshaun Corbin who's never stepped on an NFL field just yet do you think Corbin has a shot over a guy like Antonio Williams I think he does I think Antonio Williams might have the slight inside track just being a veteran also he knows the offense he's a little bit more physical than just Sean Corbin, but I think Corbin has a realistic opportunity to to take over if he beats him out in training camp. But the thing about Sean Corbin, and I'm glad you brought this up too, just as a receiver, he was used in a variety of different ways at Florida State. If you look at like his target total, it wasn't just like, oh, I'm going to catch a flare pass out of the backfield. Oh, I got a little choice route over the middle of the field. This is nice and fun. No, like they would motion him out, like just split off of the line of scrimmage, split off the tight end, and he would run like a seven route with like a double move like baked into it. Like I believe his touchdown, it was in the slot. It was a little like quick screen that he caught, but still they trusted him to do a variety of different things as a receiver. So if you could prove that in training camp too with this offense that we're hoping that we see with Brian Dable, that's going to be an asset as well. And I'm not certain if Antonio Williams has that much of a variety in his receiving game. So I'm looking forward to it. I I think that's going to be the camp battle. And I think you can throw Gary Brightwell into that conversation as well, because Gary Brightwell was a six round pick from last year's regime. He's not solidified on this roster. I think he can make the roster certainly, but it's definitely not a certainty. He's going to have to earn that. The only two running backs that I look at and I'm like, yeah, they're probably going to make the roster, obviously Barkley and then Matt Breida. I agree with you there. Now we're going to go on to the next guy. And I don't know if I'm spoiled looking at guys like Aziz Ojolari or Kayvon Thibodeau, for some reason, Nick, I don't get too much of the hype surrounding Tamon Fox. Now, Tamon Fox obviously played six years at North Carolina, the ACC. Some of his strengths, powerful powerful tackler versus the run because of his instincts. He plays better in pass coverage than expected. Good change of direction. But weaknesses, he needs to work on shedding blocks consistently. Doesn't blow up his targets. Most of his tackles are drags and some say that he does lack the size for defensive end, but he's going to be an outside linebacker in wing system. Uh, obviously, he had nine sacks this past year. The year before that, seven. Uh, the year before that, seven as well. And then the first three years, hovering around the two, three, four mark. I don't know. I just don't feel the hype around Tamon Fox. Maybe it's because he's an undrafted free agent, and I'm looking at guys like Kayvon and Aziz. Uh, what are your thoughts on Tamon Fox? Heck, Tamon Fox is an undrafted free agent. You could sign me up for that. Now, he's an older dude. He played six years in college, but he was uber productive. He had like over, just trying to pull up his PFF, I think he had like over 150 pressures in college. And then he also had like 36 sacks or something like that. So he's converting his pressures into sacks. Like he was wildly productive for UNC. And I was really shocked when I when I saw that because I didn't know much about Jamon Fox until the Giants picked him up. And I was like, all right, let's check him out. He's probably in yeah, And then I was like, whoa, this guy's uber productive. Now, I see a player who he's not the bendiest. He's not that kind of guy, but he can win high side. He has a solid, I would say for UDFA, a good first couple steps up that pass rushing arc. He does a good job bending or dipping that inside shoulder and then winning with use of hands and enough bend high side. So that's through the outside shoulder of the tackle when you're when you're rushing from a wider angle. Plus, I saw counter moves. It wasn't just like he had one thing. I saw adaptability in his pass rush plan. Now, it's not to the level of Kayvon Thibodeau or Aziz Ojolari, to your point. But for UDFA, I'll take that. But another thing that I love about him, this is something that I feel like has been an issue with, with pass rushers for the New York Giants. He has a strength element to him. He's, he's kind of like a, a dude shot out of a cannon. And I've, I've seen him convert speed to power. I've seen him go through, attempt to win with speed up the pass rushing arc and then engage power through his core and his legs and then turn basically what was a, a speed rush into a bull rush and then just absolutely put tackles in this really precarious situation. So I actually really like Timon Fox. But I think his path to the roster, I think the Giants might try to squeak him on the practice squad, but I do think he can actually crack the 53. It's going to be at the expense of O'Shane Zimenez, who has one more year left on his roster. And he's somebody who doesn't have that power element to his game. He's a little bit quicker than a Tomon Fox. I feel like he's a little bit more, 
uh, adept with his use of hands, but we haven't seen it because he's been injured and he's also somewhat of a liability as a run defender. I'm not saying Fox is going to come in here and he's going to set the edge and be this absolute athlete as a run defender, but at the college level, he was he was solid at it. He, he, he could do it. But I do believe if he makes this roster, Wink Martindale will find a way to to utilize his skill set. I think it's I think there's a possibility. I think and I don't want to say, say that for every one of these guys, but I think a lot of these guys there is a possibility, mainly because this is a new regime here. We're looking for certain players, different players than the players that we've seen over the last several seasons with Patrick Graham and even going before Patrick Graham with uh, Betcher. So. I like Timon. It seems like I like Timon Fox a little bit better than you, but I don't think his path to the roster is is a certainty because there are some hurdles and there are some players that are you know solid that he has to beat out. I definitely agree with you there. Uh, in terms of the O'Shane Zimenez part, O'Shane Zimenez is who he is. Yeah. Um, I know a lot of people hate him, obviously, because of the penalties he's, he caused like last year and whatever, and he was inactive for a few games. But he is who he is at this level. What is he entering? His fourth year in the league. He is who he is. Uh, I definitely think he's going to be gone at the end of the summer. My thing with Tamon Fox in terms of roster, and I'm going to ask you a question at the end of this, is there is a couple of guys, first of all, it doesn't help him in a way that there's a ton of linebackers that are on the bubble. Um, you look at just the outside linebackers, the pass rushers that we have. You already have Locks and Kayvon and Aziz Ojolari. You go to that second level, you have Quincy Roche and you have Ellison Smith. Jihad Ward seems like a lock for this roster because of the leadership he can show. That leaves it to Taman Fox and O'Shane Zimenez. Are they really going to keep five, six outside linebackers and also add that to how many inside linebackers we're going to have just generally in that linebacker room? Because you already know Blake Martinez is a lock. You already know the two draft picks and Darian Beavers and Micah McFadden are locks. Now it's a battle between Justin Hilliard, who's a special team, who's going to be out the first two games anyway. You got Cam Brown in there, uh, Carter Coughlin. If I'm missing any, I apologize. But also, I forgot to add in the outside linebacker room, you got Nico Lalos too. So do you think he's going to keep an extra couple of linebackers, unlike some NFL rosters are? So I think what's interesting about the linebacker in the edge room and Wink Martindale, who uses a lot of unique personnel packages. I mean, he had a personnel package last year that had like six outside linebackers or something just crazy. So he's going to use all of his defensive personnel. But what's unique about these guys is a lot of them are versatile. Like if you look at the linebackers, Carter Coughlin, he was an edge in college. Cam Brown, he's played edge in the NFL. Jihad Ward, that's a 300 pound edge right there. Like they brought in a 300 pound edge and he, he's, he's solid at it, to be honest. I mean, for, for somebody who is that big and he's more, I think, going to take on a leadership role, they'll kick him inside in some passing situations when he is playing edge, he'll probably play edge to the boundary, but he can set a mean edge, Jihad Ward. Ellerson Smith, that's somebody else who can be an interior pass rusher in certain situations. Now you don't want to, you know, bench Dexter Lawrence and, and Leonard Williams all that often, but Ellerson Smith can line edge. He can line a defensive line. So a lot of these guys can, can wear a lot of hats, which I think is going to make players who can't a little bit more expendable guys like maybe a Jalen Holmes or some of those other guys that we might be going over in a little bit. But in terms of Timon Fox, that's why I'm like, Ugh, I don't know if he's actually going to make the team because of what you said. And this is a good problem to have at the moment because you can try to stash him on the practice squad, but you have KT, you have Aziz, you have Quincy Roche, and those are your three, right? And then you have Ellerson Smith and Jihad Ward, Jihad Ward being a little bit of a he could be an inside guy. He can do this. He could do that. I'm not too worried about like Nico Lalos in terms of Timon Fox. I like Nico Lalos. I don't think he would make the team over someone like a Timon Fox, but anything can happen. And then O'Shane, I, I think he's on the roster bubble. I think he really has to have a good camp to make this roster. Yeah, definitely an uphill battle for the linebackers you just mentioned. Moving in temporarily to the DB room, uh, Trenton Thompson out of San Diego State. There's a couple of things about him. Uh, obviously, he, made, he played a couple of years in college. Just like Tamon Fox, he played six. Uh, can play the nickel deep in the box. Older player, instincts, heavy hitter. Uh, his athleticism, if you look at his pro day and his combine, isn't there too much. Uh, but obviously, some of these guys, they'll show it more in games than they do the testing. Recognizes routes, plays well, that goes to his instincts. And multiple block punts, forced fumbles on special teams. So what are your thoughts on Trenton Thompson? Uh, and obviously, we talked about special teams with Jeremiah Hall. This could be another guy that cracks the roster because of his use on special teams. Yeah, so I know he didn't test all that well. 
But I actually like Trenton Thompson's tape. I like Yusef Corker's tape, but I think Thompson might even be a little bit uh, more versatile because I think you can man him up against tight ends, you know, if he proves himself. But I think he has that capability from an athletic standpoint. This is somebody who had pretty good ball production. He had 14 PBUs. He had, I think, three interceptions. And you can also see some of the – one of those interceptions, I think it was against, like, San Jose State. He was – I think he was on one route that was going over the top and he was able to flash his eyes. And I think it was man coverage to the quarterback. So all the quarterback was targeting the seven route. He came off the vert and then undercut the seven for the pick in the end zone. So I liked his instincts there. I liked his processing. I actually, I felt like I was a bigger fan of Trenton Thompson than maybe even a Yusef Corker, but I like Corker a lot. Corker gives me a little bit of like poor man's Jabril Peppers vibes. Like you want that guy coming down the alley and you want him to be an excellent defender in run support. I would say he's solid in run support, mainly because he could just give you bone jarring hits, which Trenton Thompson can give as well. So I like Trenton Thompson. I like Yusef Corker. I think their path to the roster is a lot easier than some of these other guys that we've been going over because you have Julian Love, you have Dane Belton, you have Xavier McKinney. Then who do you have at safety? And if you can play man coverage, like Trenton Thompson seems like he can do, he has length, he's pretty big, he can provide pop, he's not a liability to run support and coverage, he shows good instincts, has ball skills. I think a guy like that can realistically crack the roster. And just to, since we're talking about safety, I don't know if you have a specific question about you, Seth Corker, he could too. But again, there's only a finite amount of roster spots, and that's why this training camp is to me, one of the most exciting training – it is the most exciting training camp since I started covering the Giants. Now, I've only been covering the Giants for like two years, but so many of these roster spots are up in the air, and there's so much to prove with the new coaching staff. So I look at both Thompson and Corker, and I think to myself, there's a path for both these guys. And when you look at what Wink Martindale has done in the past with the safety position, he has taken cornerback converts. He has taken six-round picks, seventh-round picks, and turned those dudes into guys who play 500, 600, 700 snaps a year if they're healthy. So – Martindale has an ability to take a guy who's a UDFA and turn him into a player in that defense as long as they have the mental processing to handle it and they can do a variety of different things. And I think Thompson fits that maybe a little bit better than Corker, but Corker, the things that Corker does well are freaking pretty good. And mainly it's him being an alley defender against run support, but he's also solid in zone, has good instincts as well. Just man coverage is a little bit more shaky ground than I would say Thompson is. Yeah, I definitely agree with you there. And the one thing, as you mentioned, that helps these guys is we don't know what's happening behind Julian Love and Xavier McKinney. There is a lot of question marks. Now, Dane Belton is a lock, but I tend to think that Trenton Thompson has a little more of a versatile skill set than Dane Belton does. Belton, not necessarily – I mean, he, some people say that he can play against tight ends, but you've seen him against wide receivers. I mean, he got burned by Wandell Robinson – uh, funny enough, both of them are on the same team. And he was honestly, if, if you look at the Giants community, he was, in my opinion, my least favorite pick because it was fourth round. I'm like, eh, you know, I'm not too excited by this guy. But one thing that, once again, helps all these guys also helps Dane Belton is because behind Julian Love and behind Xavier McKinney, there is not much safety help. Now, one thing that could obviously come into play is you already got three safeties down. You got Trenton Thompson, you got Yusuf Corker, and obviously you mentioned he's a poor man's Jabril Peppers, which works in Martindale's system. And then you got Henry Black, who is a safety as well. He is a veteran safety. I don't think I'm missing anybody, but there's also other guys that could possibly come in and compete. Uh, do you think that both these guys make the roster? Do you think Trenton Thompson makes the roster? Do you think that Henry Black possibly makes it over both of them? What are your thoughts? Honestly, I don't think – any of them right now have an inside track. I think it's a pure on competition. It's going to come down to training camp. So I don't even know if I want to seal my, like, oh, this is who I think is going to make it. I think Corker has a good chance. I think Thompson does. I don't really have much on black, but I know he's been around the league. I think he was in like green Bay last year. If I, if I remember correctly, but you brought up Dane Belton. I think this is uh, important to know Dane Belton. Like right now in the NFL, Every defense is looking for a player similar to a Dane Belton, a player who is a safety who can play in the box. Xavier McKinney, for instance, Jabril Peppers, for instance. They're looking for these players who can be assets in the run game, who can execute their run fits, who are not going to be liabilities against the run, yet they are athletic enough to cover maybe bigger wide receivers, cover the tight end and who could just do a multitude of different things. One of the most important positions in football right now that everybody's looking to find 
is a nickel defender who is versatile, who are typically safeties because cornerbacks are a little bit smaller and not as good at run support. Because if you have that defender, then you don't have to allocate so many assets into defending against the run and you could allocate more to defeating the pass. But one of the paramount things in terms of defense against offense still in the NFL, which a lot of people don't realize, is fitting the run and stopping the run. And that's why you see guys like Jordan Davis go early. That's why you see the Chargers be like, look, we always sell out to stop the pass, but it really burned us last year. We didn't make the playoffs last year because we couldn't stop the freaking run against Las Vegas in week 18 last year. If you remember that, remember? And so, like, I think Dane Belton, when I watched his film, I, I found he was a little bit inconsistent, even as a run defender, because I felt like as an open field tackler, sometimes he didn't execute the right technique and and he allowed people to juke him out. But a lot of the times he did that, he was boxing that guy inside. So he was getting to his outside hip, allowing him to bounce back inside. And then a pursuing defender would come and make that tackle. So there, there are elements of, of, of his missed tackles that still kept the defense, the construct of the defense intact, if that makes sense. And I, um, I think he's going to have a role. I do. I think he's going to have a pretty big role this year. I'm wondering where Darnay Holmes what will fit into this defense. Cause I think I, I like Darnay Holmes, but he's small. And I think that really works against him, which sucks, but it's a reality in the NFL. So I think the secondary room just in general, is going to be fascinating, but I'm just saying, man, a lot, a lot of teams are looking for players similar to a Dane belt, maybe not a Dane belt. I would like a little bit more consistency, but I will say this, man, he played in a pesky ass zone defense out there in Iowa, man, Kirk Ferentz, the way he trains him. If you watch his interceptions, he did such a good job baiting quarterbacks in quick game, which a lot of offenses operate in quick game concepts, you know, quick little West coast type of concepts. And if you watch Dane Belton, he did such a good job. Okay. Say it was a, a, a slant flat, you know, simple concept. We see it all the time in the NFL, right? He's over the, the flat defender. He did such a good job going with that flat defender initially flashing his eyes to the quarterback, seeing the quarterback was going to the slant right behind his back, knowing that his cornerback is in outside leverage he, so Dane Belton knows that cornerback's an outside leverage. So he knows the quarterback thinks that I'm going to have that slant open. So what he would do is he would bait that flat route. And then right when he would go to throw the football, he would undercut the slant. And Dane Belton came away with, I think, two or three of his interceptions that way. So he has that type of ability. I'm hoping that can be leveraged by Wink Martindale because turnovers are king in the NFL. And Belton showed ball skills last season. So let's hope that can translate this season. Yeah, five picks definitely says a lot about his ball skills. Um, so moving back to the offensive side before we go to back to the defensive side for our next guy. But for this guy, we talked about him earlier uh, alongside Jeremiah Hall. Austin Allen out of Nebraska. He is also one of my favorites. I, I just have a thing, I guess, for offense. But then again, if you're a Giants fan and you've seen the 31st ranked offense for the last two years, why not? Yeah, um, but... He had 602 receiving yards on 38 receptions for Nebraska last year, two touchdowns. He has the ability to absorb contact in the middle of the field. Good job with down blocks, has an IQ for blocking angles, can make defenders miss, possible red zone threat. Uh, I know a lot of people view him as a 50-50 guy, uh, kind of like Galladay, of course, but this time tight end, uh, which I think Ricky Seals-Jones has that uh, same skill set of being a 50-50 guy. Weaknesses, low college production until the last two seasons. He's not very quick. Uh, his athleticism, once again, occasionally lacks play strength and push at the line of scrimmage. And many found to uh, see that he had a tough time against tougher competition and higher competition, Iowa and Wisconsin being those teams. Uh, your thoughts on Austin Allen? Yeah, Austin Allen. So, I think I, I've criticized his athletic ability just because this dude's six foot nine. I think he has good acceleration. I don't know about a short area wiggle and, and change of direction, but that's fine. This guy's a, like, he's almost six foot nine. He's like 255 pounds. I think you're spot on with all the blocking things that you said. He takes good angles. One thing that I do have an issue with, and it kind of goes to your point about the weakness and strength is his pad level. It's hard for him to establish leverage. And when you can't establish leverage, it's hard for you to explode through the ground and lift defenders and then really own them at the point of attack. So that's something he's going to have to work on. He's not the most flexible in that area. But even against the Iowa game, I would say that wasn't one of his best games. But there were a couple runs that he helped spring that were like 20-yard freaking runs 
when it was to his side and he was blocking on an angle, blocking an edge on an angle, getting to his outside shoulder and creating that seal. And that's difficult for a dude who's six foot nine to have those type of movement skills, maintain solid leverage, and then also not allow said edge or linebacker to get outside and affect the running back. So I, there were times against Iowa that I was impressed, but I would agree it wasn't like his Minnesota game and it wasn't like his Wisconsin game. And you watch the Minnesota game, there were times where he was going over the middle of the field and he would just get cracked right at the catch point, hold on to the football. You're like, oh, look at this guy, man. This guy is tough as nails. So I, I do appreciate Austin Allen. I think if he has a really good training camp, possibly if Ricky Seals Jones or Jordan Akins, probably more so Jordan Akins, if he has a relationship with the tight end coach, Austin Allen could make the roster. But the path to that, I think, is a little bit up in the air. And I think he'll ultimately settle on the practice squad. But I do love the fact that he is that big. He has the concentration. He displays soft hands. He doesn't drop a ton of footballs. And he has a blocking profile, which is just not common in young tight ends. You know, they don't come into the NFL and they're just good at blocking. Like Daniel Bellinger, he was a really good college blocker. We're going to see how that translates in year one at the NFL level. So with this position group being as as poor as it is right now in terms of the depth, I think he has a inside or I think he has an okay chance, but was, will Brian Dable want to carry two tight ends who are rookies? That's another question mark that we have to look how involved will the tight end position be in this offense? Another one that we have to look at. So ultimately I think he'll be a practice squad guy, but I agree with you, Alex. I think he's somebody who is interesting at the least. Yeah. And one thing I was going to ask, but at the same time, I thought about Jeremiah Hall is would they possibly carry four tight ends? Now, I don't think so. The last couple of years, we've seen that initially. Like in 2020, they had Evan Ingram. They had Caden Smith. They had Eric Tomlinson. They also had another guy, uh, Levine Toy Lolo. So they have carried four tight ends before. But we're also looking at a new age offense where it's not, you know, totally um, medieval times. But – Possibly, I guess, for that scenario to come about is Brian Dable wanting the potential of blocking tight ends. Now, once again, I don't see why they would keep in this situation, other than the fact that their alternatives are rookies. I don't see why they would keep Seals Jones and Akins if they want a blocking upside because Seals Jones and Akins, you know, they have their own skill set in the receiving game. Seals Jones, obviously and uh, Aikens aren't good blockers. So Jones is a 50-50 guy. Jordan Aikens is a little bit more faster. So once again, could four tight ends happen possibly, but I think it's very unlikely. Um, And I think you do make a good point about Allen being stashed on the practice squad, unless one of our veteran tight ends gets hurt. Yes. And that's another huge, it's not kind of like a weird aspect of football. Like you become like really good friends with like your teammates, but there's that comp, there's that inherent competition that if something happens to this guy, then I drastically benefit. So that's like one of those weird aspects that I've always thought about in the NFL and just in football in general. But you are right with Austin Allen, man. I think I think practice squad is is that could be the, the path for him if something does happen to Jordan Akins, Ricky Seals Jones, Chris Myrick. I'm just not sure. Four tight ends, I don't think so either. Three tight ends, even. If you look at Buffalo, I think there will be three tight ends, but if you look at Buffalo, there were times where they just dressed Austin Knox. That's all they dressed. They would just bring in Dawson Knox, be like, oh, we're not going to run anything more than, you know, uh, 11 personnel. And if we want another tight end, we'll just stick our fullback there. And that's where Jeremiah Hall kind of factors into the tight end room. And that's why I think this is a, any factors into the running back room. And that's why I think this is another reason why it's a pretty fascinating situation that the Giants have. When you look at the tight end room, I know we already went over it, but it's not necessarily strong. So what's going to happen with some of these dudes? Like who's going to be expendable? Like, is Chris Myrick going to make this roster? I don't necessarily think so, but Anything is possible if these guys really ball out in training camp. Yeah, you do bring up a good point about Dawson Knox, and I just thought of it now. I mean, you don't necessarily need blocking tight ends a lot if you run the second least in the league. Them and the Buccaneers the last few years has mostly been passing, 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 and then using your running backs when you can, plus receiving threats. Um, But, yeah, I, I could definitely see that scenario for the New York Giants. And to wrap up at least the UDFAs, now we will go over a short list afterwards. Uh, after this one, uh, candidate, of course, or I should say on drafted free agent, guys that you know are on the side that are not necessarily talked about, but just to offer some quick thoughts. Uh, 
for the final guy, Christopher Hinton out of Michigan. <laughs> nice. uh, one sack this past year, one tackle for a loss, total of 32 tackles. Wrestling background does give him the good balance, moves well in the passing game for his size, does not have the hand placement to push aside blockers and plays too tall at times. Now, I want to ask you this, Nick, because you probably know a lot more than I do in this respect. Why do some Giant fans like this guy over DJ Davidson? Over DJ, so they're both like the, their body types are completely different. DJ Davidson is what like three hundred and thirty pounds, three hundred twenty nine pounds. Christopher Hinton is you know just a couple pounds over three hundred. I think why maybe is because they know him a little bit more. Michigan is a bigger program than Arizona State. Shout out to Arizona. Shout out to Tempe. But I like Hinton because the dude is a run defender, man. And I think you put this dude as a four eye, you put him as a, a five technique. He's going to anchor down in the ground. If he keeps his pad level low, if he keeps his hips low, he's pretty solid in that area. I don't feel like he offers much as a pass rusher. DJ Davidson might offer a little bit more from the interior in that manner. But I would say the reason why people probably appreciate Hinton a little bit more is because he's a little bit more consistent as a run defender and they probably look at DJ Davidson like, what, he's just going to back up Dexter Lawrence and Justin Ellis. Where else is this guy going to play other than, you know, one technique nose, one technique, possibly two eye. They might view Christopher Hinton as a little bit more versatile than a DJ Davidson. I, I still think I'm on board of DJ Davidson over a Christopher Hinton personally. But I think Hinton, if any of these undrafted free agents, the Jabari Ellis is the Ryder Andersons of the world. I think Hinton might have a better chance of making the roster because of what he can do on early down which is still a big part of what Wink Martindale wants to do. He wants these big bodies up front that can stop the run when the opposing offenses attempt to run the football. They've had a pretty good run defense for a while, the, the Ravens, because they do a good job fitting all their gaps. And Hinton is somebody who can do a good job just anchoring down and, and does a pretty good job playing the peekaboo game, looking around blocks, shedding, and then making the tackle at the, uh, at the point of attack in the block. Now, I just thought of this, of course. This is something to look at for the future. Here's why I say that. You have Dexter Lawrence, who just got his fifth-year option accepted, but is he going to get an, a, con a contract extension knowing he's from two coaching staffs ago and one regime ago? Uh, Leonard Williams, he could possibly get cut next year. I think they're in financial position to cut him, if they want to do that, of course. Uh, Justin Ellis, who they signed – I believe he came from the Raiders. He also played with the Ravens for a little while, hence the connection. He's on a one-year contract. So also as well, Jalen Holmes, if he makes the roster, that's a one-year contract ideally, and he's a rotational piece. So with that being said, DJ Davidson definitely feels, fills one of those spots, but they need more guys. And I think Christopher Hinton possibly, maybe not this year, cracks a ton, cracks the, the roster for a ton of playing time in his role but maybe something like next year if he at least has a good camp and at least makes some plays in the running game in the preseason thoughts i think it can easily happen i think he can make the practice squad and i like i said i think he has a chance to make the roster i think it depends on what you want if you want a more explosive pass rushing type of guy jabari ellis is more your guy the kid from south carolina Ryder anderson's a little bit more of like a four three five technique defensive end but just because wink martindale runs a lot of odd fronts and is a three four doesn't mean you can't utilize somebody who is more fit to be a four three type of guy you're going to see a lot of versatility in how martindale employs his defensive fronts his defensive personnel so Ryder anderson he could figure into that i don't think he ultimately will jalen holmes i think it's interesting because he has experience with Andre Patterson, who's the new defensive line coach for the Giants, which I'm really excited about. I was really excited about Sean Spencer. I think Sean Spencer is the absolute man, great coach, Coach Chaos. But I'm really excited about this experienced coach in Andre Patterson. I think Dexter Lawrence will be – well, he will be on the roster next year. Leonard Williams, that we got to see how he plays this season. I don't think he's lost a step. Now, he didn't have the sack production that he had last year. I think he had six and a half sacks, if I'm not mistaken. I don't have the numbers in front of me. And then obviously in 2020, he had like 11 and a half. He absolutely blew up. But Leonard Williams, he's not Aaron Donald. He's not that type of guy. He's not Chris Jones, but he's a damn good defensive lineman who can rush the passer. And he's very good against the run. I think he figures to, to be a big part of what, what Wink Martindale wants to do defensively up front. And in terms of Hinton though, to go back to your question, 
I think ultimately if he doesn't beat out DJ Davidson, which I don't believe he will, if he can't beat out Jalen Holmes, then he'll end up on the practice squad. And he, he could be somebody that a team who has a weak run defense looks at and says, okay, we'll sign him to our 53, bring him in and then see what he has. So if I had to bet on one of these, one of these, anybody in the front, anybody in the front seven who wasn't a draft pick to make the roster. So you're looking at Timon Fox, Jabari Ellis, Ryder Anderson, and Christopher Hinton. I think Christopher Hinton probably has the best chance, but still so much has to play out in training camp. So I'm saying this prior, it's July 1st right now, you know, training camp starts at the end of the month. So I'm saying this now, but I think Christopher Hinton probably has the inside track over those other three players. So to go quickly, over these guys. And the reason why I picked out those six, seven UDFAs, because I think they have the best chance to make an impact or make the roster. But there's also these guys on the side. Um, I'll go over the DBs real quick. Zion Gilbert and Darren Evans at LSU. Um, obviously, I haven't done much research in these guys. I've kind of, to be honest, you favored the six, seven that we just went over. Uh, what can you say about Zion Gilbert, obviously, at a Florida Atlantic and then Darren Evans out of LSU? Darren Evans, we'll start there because Joe Shane saw a lot of LSU. He watched a lot of Cordell Flott. So Darren Evans is a long, thin, not too physical type of cornerback. Smooth backpedal, if I remember correctly. And I haven't watched his film in a little bit. But I, I would be scared to have him on the football field against guys who are a lot stronger than he is. Similar to Cordell Flott, he needs to kind of fill out his frame. But he has that long frame that, that you're really looking for for cornerbacks. Typically, you want your cornerbacks on the outside to have, you know, 32-plus inch arms. Don't have the numbers in front of me. I can look him up real quick. But I'm pretty sure Darren Evans has, like, ridiculously long arms. And I'm going to look it up right here live. Just because, I, if I remember correctly, Darren Evans, six foot. Uh, that's not even him. That's some halfback, but I'm pretty sure he has really long arms. So it's uh, that's something that will be working in his favor, but needs to get a little bit more physical, but he has that chip on his shoulder, similar to Cordell Flott, somebody who isn't scared of contact. It's not, it's not a, a, a lack of, of uh, toughness in the mind, mental toughness. It's just a lack of maybe physical toughness at the tackle point and then just up the route stem and things like that. And you got to work on man coverage. And then Zion Gilbert, he's somebody if I remember correctly, solid size, little bit light in the pants, good zone instincts, but that's kind of what I, that's all, that's all I really have on him right now. I don't have my notes in front of me. I didn't expect either of these guys to, to make the team, maybe Evans a little bit more than Gilbert, but from what I remember when the Giants brought in Kennedy, when they brought in Jaquette, I think those guys have a much better chance of cracking this roster as veteran players in the UDFAs, who I do believe will be stashed on the practice squad because it's going to be important. Because if you have any any problem or issue with this roster that you feel like could crop up, it has to be the secondary, right? It has to be the cornerback room. They're a lot worse off right now than they were last year. You lose James Bradbury. That's a huge loss. And I like Aaron Robinson now. It's, I do. I'm a big Aaron Robinson fan. I think he'll be fine. But the NFL is violent. If a Dory Jackson goes down, if Aaron Robinson goes down, what are we talking about here? We're talking about Rodarius Williams, who I like, coming off of a torn ACL, six-round pick last year. We're talking about Jerron Williams, who I like. But he's somebody who I feel like had a lot of actually good reps. I wrote a piece on Big Blue View maybe about a month ago, if you guys want to go check it out, just detailing what he offers. But you still don't want him starting in the NFL because you know what every offensive coordinator is going to do. Oh, we're going to target that guy. They're going to try to get one-on-ones with their number one receivers against him, and then they're just going to pick on him and pick on him and pick on him. Similar to what we saw back in, what was that, 2020, when we when the Giants played the Green Bay Packers. It might have been 2019, and they just picked on Corey. Yeah, it was 2019. They just picked on Corey Valentine, the Packers. Remember that? Aaron Rodgers was just picking on him. So I feel like if something happens to Adore Jackson, somebody who has been injured a lot in his career, that could be the path. But in terms of these UDFAs, I didn't expect them to make the team after I watched them right after the Giants signed them. But like I said throughout this entire podcast, Alex, anything's possible, man. Anything is possible. We've seen guys who we didn't know anything about rise to the occasion and then make the final 53-man roster. And we've seen those guys fail, and we've seen those guys have success. So anything is possible at the moment, but I'm not overly optimistic about those two. I'm more optimistic about some of the other guys we went over a little bit earlier. So the next two... Ryder Anderson and Jabari Ellis, both defensive linemen. Uh, you obviously said that Jabari Ellis offers a little bit more in terms of pass rush than a guy like Christopher Hinton. Uh, your thoughts on both of them? 
Yeah, Jabari Ellis, I remember he had a couple of plays where he was like the one technique and he just flashed really quick hands. That's something that you want as a pass rusher. Now he's not a dominant pass rusher, he's a UDFA, so put it into perspective, but he has reps where he was able to anticipate what the center or what the guard was going to do and then throw just a combination of moves to get into the backfield and get a tackle for a loss or get a sack or just put pressure on the quarterback. So I think he has that type of skill set. He has that type of body too. He's a little bit more stout, if I'm not mistaken, and he's like 280 pounds. So he's not somebody who is, you know, these 300 something pounders or anything like that. And in terms of Ryder Anderson, I saw him a little bit more as a four, three edge. This is a player who played at Ole Miss for a lot of his career. Then he transferred to Oklahoma or I mean, Indiana and played uh, with Micah McFadden. And, uh, and it's funny, man, when you watch Micah McFadden, you see Ryder Anderson out there. And I think he's, he's a solid overall player who can who can set the edge against the run he offers some upside as a pass rusher slanting inside doing things like that but i i didn't look at him and think he was going to be somebody who was going to eventually make the roster but a solid practice squad guy who is if he is called up has some experience in multiple different systems and he can at least you know play 10 snaps here and there and not be a complete liability as a run defender and not be a complete dud as a pass rusher so the next two guys I'll go over. One's not really an undrafted free agent. Uh, one is, I'm going to start out with Andre Miller, who is making the transition from a wide receiver to a tight end. And I think one of the bigger reasons is that he's a 50-50 ball guy. Your thoughts on Andre Miller from Maine? That, and he's like 200. He's like a biscuit away from, from being a tight end. I don't have his numbers in front of me, but I want to say he's like almost 230 pounds. So they want to try to rice and john him. And that's what I think he's going to be. I think he's going to be this regime's rice and john. So what I mean by that is he's this converted wide receiver to tight end. Now he's not Canadian to, to my to my knowledge, but I think he's going to come into the practice squad and, and just ride it out and try to develop that tight end. And hopefully they can maybe kind of get that athletic ability, maintain that athletic ability, and just get him to be a little bit stronger on the line of scrimmage. I, it was hard to find his film. I watched a little bit of it. I thought I saw the contested catch ability that you bring up. I remember he had a long touchdown. I can't remember the team, though. He had a, this really long touchdown. That was impressive. But as I always say, he was playing against a bunch of freaking accountants and stuff like that and future doctors. But, uh, yeah, I think he's destined for the practice squad and destined for the Rice and John role. But, hey, Remember, Alex, last offseason, last training camp, Rice and John looked like a stud in preseason and training camp before he got injured. So, I mean, maybe he would have developed it. I'm sure he probably would have saw the football field last year with how bad the Giants were. So let's let, let's hope the Giants aren't in that situation again. But, yeah, Andre Miller, I think he's practice quarter. Now, do you have anything – and obviously, you know, he, he's coming from a different country, so it's, it's a whole different story. Yeah. But do you have anything on Roy from Nigeria? Oh, why don't you try that last name, Alex? <laughs> Med no. M Bay take us something like that. Yeah, I don't try it on my podcast, and I, I love to challenge myself, but that one's a little bit difficult. And no, I don't have anything on him. I mean, I know that he he I guess you could say he subscribes to the planet theory that George Young put out a while ago. Just when you're that big and that athletic, you want to give them a shot, similar to Marcus McKethan, right? When you're that big and that athletic and you have those types of movement skills with the size that you possess then maybe we could see if you could play football. And that's all. He could be great for all I know. I just haven't seen anything really on him other than him hitting a couple bags in, in uh, like OTAs and minicamp or whatever that was. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of the Giants brought in a shot putter in 2019, Austin Drusma. He was a shot putter at Florida State, played college uh, – excuse me, he played high school football but didn't play for a couple of years – so it's possibly just like a project like that. Another Sandro Platzcomer, that stuff. Uh, but Nick, any final thoughts, my guy? Final thoughts? No, I, I think more so than other years, the Giants could have maybe like two or three of these UDFAs make the roster. It's going to be at the expense of guys who've possibly been on the roster since like 2019, though, like in Oceans and Menez. And some of these other veterans who they just brought in, maybe even a Jalen Holmes. And I know he has that relationship with Andre Patterson, but he still has to prove himself. And he hasn't necessarily done that since he came into the NFL out of Ohio State several years back. David Moe, is he going to make the roster? Like, I, I don't really 100% know if, if there's going to be a place on this team for him. So I'm excited and I'm, I'm excited just to take training camp one day at a time, read these reports and see what 
exactly is going to happen. So even if you look at the offensive line, dude, the, the Giants have like 17 offensive linemen on our lads right now. Like that is so many offensive linemen. It's great. And I know two of them are injured or at least coming off of injury with Nick Gates, who is still injured. And then Matt Pear, who, who knows how, when he'll be healthy. But then you have, you know, so much depth there and, and, and players that I don't know much about, like Roy M., and maybe even Devery Hamilton. I don't have too much on him either. So I'm just pumped to see how this all shakes out. And I think there's training camp battles up and down, legit training camp battles up and down this depth chart. Yeah, it's definitely going to be exciting training camp. Uh, I'm, I, this is probably the most excited I've been about undrafted free agents ever because now we have a new regime. We have a, a new general manager, and this team is going to be one of the younger teams in the NFL um but appreciate everyone who's watching like comment subscribe turn on that notification bell share this out as well nick i'd like to thank you for coming on uh you do some great work in the giants community i would also like to thank you for your service uh to this country my man. hi thanks alex and if anybody wants to go and digest my stuff at nick filato it's right there check out big blue banter myself and CBS's Dan Schneier, we, we host a podcast about the New York Giants going over the evaluation and the All-22 and the X's and O's and the scheme and, and all of that type of stuff. And all my written work is over there at Big Blue View. So you can go check it out there. All good stuff. Thank you for coming on. Peace. Thanks, Alex. All right. So before we close out the show, one more undrafted free agent to go over. He's going to be like the guys we mentioned in the last part of the video, guys like Ryder Anderson and Jabari Ellis and Andre Miller. Uh, not one of the top seven, thank the Lord, but I did forget this guy, and I'm not going to finish the video without mentioning him. Of course, I did contact uh, Nick Filato, and he gave me some of his thoughts on him a few minutes after the interview uh, slash discussion, whatever you want to call it. So that guy is Josh Rivas, Kansas State guard. Four years at Kansas State, he had a total of 23 games started, appeared in 46 uh, to go year by year. In his first year in 2018, he played 12 games, only started two. 2019, he played 13 games, didn't start any. In 2020, he played in eight games, started all of them. And then in 2021, he played in 13 games, started all of them. So the deal with this guy and some characteristics, and I'll talk about you know my thoughts on him just a little bit. Uh, I haven't done much research, but of course, I've seen some characteristics and whatnot uh, from a couple of different scouting reports and so on and so forth. So he does play with a wide base and has the agility to mirror. He has quick enough feet to be a good run blocker, and he's got a solid frame to be a pass protector. He's about 6'6", 320 pounds, so that's a tall offensive guard right there. He also has a strong upper half. Uh, that includes his hands. However, he doesn't have elite quickness, which could be a concern versus NFL rushers, whether it's you know rushers on the edge playing inside or just quick defensive linemen he relies on strength a lot which allows defenders to go inside and of course uh, he has a problem with oversetting and overextending which a lot of undrafted free agent guards have that problem a lot of guards overall have that problem but um, with that being said in terms of Josh Rivas and that's why you know I list him with the other undrafted free agents not really in the top seven because it's a crowded roster right now and if it was the DB room or if it was a different room, if it was the tight end room, I would say, okay, maybe he does have a shot to make the roster. But where Joe Shane has brung in about 13 different offensive linemen, most of them with experience and most of them with versatility, I don't know if Josh Rivas has this, you know, a spot on the roster. He probably does have a spot on the practice squad. They'll probably try to develop him and do whatever. But um, I don't think he's going to be a major factor uh, for the New York Giants this season. He'll probably be playing with the third team in the preseason. Uh, in training camp so that's pretty much that hope you guys have a good fourth of july weekend and we will see you in the next video peace out see you later stay cool